for lecture 28. Today we are going to focus on understanding what limits primary productivity in different ecosystems. And as a reminder, uh, today I am posting a quiz up on Blackboard uh, and this quiz is going to be due by Friday at 10 a.m. So I'm actually going to give you a little bit more time uh, to make sure that you do have time to finish that. But this quiz uh, will cover the material from our last lecture, lecture 27, uh, where we talked about energy transfer in ecosystems. Now, before we begin our topic today, I just want to go over a very brief review from what we talked about last time. So last time uh, we focused on understanding energy transfer in ecosystems, and uh, we talked about uh, primary producers are really the base of energy capture for an entire ecosystem. Now, one of the main takeaway messages is that energy transfer is quite inefficient. And this is true in a couple of different ways. First, energy transfer is very inefficient when we think about energy capture by the primary producers or autotrophs in an ecosystem. The energy capture that mainly occurs during photosynthesis for most ecosystems most of the energy that is actually available for autotrophs to do photosynthesis uh, never gets utilized. Energy transfer is also inefficient up to the next level. So as a reminder, one of the measures that we have of the efficiency of, of this transfer between trophic uh, levels is known as ecological efficiency. And this is simply a measure of how much of the energy or biomass in the production of one trophic level gets converted into production, so biomass, um, or the energy stored in biomass on the next level. And so if we take a look at this pyramid for an ecosystem of net production, we can see the amount of energy that is captured in the biomass in terms of kilocalories per meter squared per year. And so, of course, you notice that as you go up trophic levels, the amount of energy found in the biomass in these trophic levels altogether is mu uh, gets progressively smaller. So to see how inefficient this transfer of energy from one trophic level to the next is, we can calculate the ecological efficiency. And what is the ecological efficiency uh, moving from primary producers to herbivores in this example? Now, on average, we generally use a sort of rule of thumb that about 10% of the net production uh, on any level is going to be transferred uh, to the next highest trophic level. So across all ecosystems and within ecosystems, on average, uh, ecological efficiency is about 10%, which is, is pretty inefficient. 90% of the energy you know, that theoretically is available never gets transferred into biomass or energy stored in the biomass and used in the production of biomass on, uh, for the next trophic level. So one reason that the degree or that the ecological efficiency of an ecosystem is important is that it can constrain the number of limit or the number of trophic levels that you that an ecosystem can sustain. Uh, the more efficient your transfer of energy is between these different trophic levels, the more likely it is that you'll have enough energy left to support uh, higher and higher trophic levels. However, other factors can also affect the number of trophic levels that we have 
in an ecosystem. And one other thing that we talked about last time was this includes uh, the amount of primary productivity that we have in a system. So if the producers are really, really productive, well, that may tend to allow for more trophic levels uh, because there's just going to be, again, more energy to pass upward to those higher trophic levels to support the higher trophic levels. And net primary production is very important because that energy captured by the primary producers uh, dictates how much energy is going to be available to the whole ecosystem. But there is a lot of variation in how productive the primary producers are in different types of ecosystems. Now, remember that when it comes to defining primary production, uh, we defined net primary production or NPP or net primary productivity uh, as being the difference between gross primary production, so this is all the energy or biomass gained through photosynthesis, minus the, minus the autotrophic respiration. And that autotrophic respiration uh, constitutes a loss of energy uh, utilized in respiration to do work. It also constitutes a loss of biomass as CO2. Uh, and it's the difference, though, between GPP and autotrophic respiration that give us net primary production, which is the biomass and energy available for consumers to consume when it comes to those primary producers. So which are the most productive ecosystems? Well, if we look at the middle panel here, we can see the average net primary production in terms of grams of biomass produced per meter squared per year. So this is a productivity or production on a per area basis. And what we see is that our most uh, productive ecosystems tend to be things like tropical rainforests, we can see here, and also our shallow ocean systems, so algal beds and reefs, that's like kelp forests and coral reefs. Uh, they tend to be extremely productive, along with things like estuaries, which are sort of coastal wetlands, and then swamp and marsh, uh, which may reflect both coastal and freshwater ecosystems. These tend to be the most productive systems, where th as things like the open ocean, the desert, and the tundra, along with lakes and streams, are non-productive environments uh, on a per area basis. But if we look at total energy capture across the whole planet, this changes a little bit. Uh, so here, if we just look at the percentage of Earth's net primary production that each of these different ecosystems contributes to, you can see that about 22% um, of total energy capture or total um, biomass gain by producers is done in tropical rainforests. Uh, again, these are very productive on a per area basis, but there's also quite a large area of them. So they make up a big, uh, a big contribution to the total net production. But the oceans uh, were actually are our most productive in total, uh, even though they're very non-productive on a per surface area basis because so much of the earth is covered by the open ocean, uh, they actually contribute the most in total. Whereas things like those very productive uh, open ocean systems and the wetlands, uh, they don't cover much area in total. And so on a global basis, they don't contribute as much uh, to net primary production at the whole Earth scale. Okay. 
So there's a lot of variation uh, between ecosystems in terms of their primary production. Uh, so what are some of the factors that limit uh, net production in these different systems that can lead to such wildly different levels of net primary productivity? Well, before we begin to look at these limiting factors, let's first talk about how we actually measure net primary productivity. So there are a couple of different ways that we can do this. One way is just to measure how much biomass you have in a given location between two different time points. So for example, in a forest, this is a very common way to estimate primary productivity. You go out one year and you measure the size of all the trees in a forest, and then you come back five years later and measure them again. And the change in those plants, those big trees, is an indication of how much biomass has accumulated over time. And thus is a pretty good measure of net primary productivity in an ecosystem. Another common way to measure primary productivity is to measure how much CO2, the net uptake of CO2 by primary producers in an ecosystem. So remember that photosynthesis, which determines the gross primary productivity, uh, utilizes CO2. So when systems are really productive and a lot of photosynthesis is occurring, CO2 gets drawn down out of the atmosphere by the vegetation or by the primary producers. Um, but on the other hand, those primary producers are also respiring some of that energy, and when they respire, they release that uh, CO2 back into the atmosphere. So one way to measure primary productivity is just to look at the net difference um, between the uptake and CO2 and just measure how CO2 levels in the air change over time over a given place. And this is what this big tower is actually doing here. It's sampling air every 30 minutes, measuring the amount of CO2 and looking at the changes in CO2 over a, a time period to, to look at how much CO2 is released versus how much CO2 is taken up. So it's actually more common in aquatic systems to measure the net release of oxygen by the producers as opposed to the net uptake of CO2. And again, this we can do this because during photosynthesis, you have a release, a release of oxygen and during autotrophic respiration, you have the use of oxygen. So that tends to draw oxygen down. So again, if you can look at the net uh, change in oxygen, it gives you a good indication of how much photosynthesis versus respiration is occurring. Uh, and that gives you an indication of net primary productivity. Now, finally, for large-scale estimates of primary productivity, we often rely on satellites um, to measure how much red or blue light is actually being absorbed at the Earth's surface. Uh, 